Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to my YouTube channel and for our third puzzle in the series. As with previous and future cases, all of these are hypothetical and do not represent data from real patients. Let's begin with a clinical scenario. We have a 47-year-old gentleman who is a right-handed gardener. There is a six-month history of tingling in the right little ring and middle fingers, as well as that border of the hand and proximal to the wrist crease too. Complaining of grip weakness and there's also some neck discomfort as well. Symptoms are present all the time and it's not clear if and when it gets worse. On clinical examination, there's reduction in the muscle bulk in the hypothena eminence and the IDIO. Tone in the arm is normal, however power is reduced 4 minus out of 5 in the hand muscles only. Sensation is reduced to pinprick on the ulnar border of the hand and partially proximal to the wrist crease as well. Let's consider the differential diagnosis here. Could it be individual nerves at fault? Well, if it was a median neuropathy, we would have expected sensory loss to have occurred on the radial side of the hand, not on the ulnar side of the hand. What about an ulnar nerve lesion? Well, I wouldn't have expected sensory loss to have extended proximal to the wrist crease, so that would argue against that too. What about a brachial plexus lesion? Well, the lowest point would be a medial cord lesion, and if that were to be the case, then I would have expected there to also be median nerve involvement too. And if it was a lower trunk brachial plexopathy, again, I'd have also expected uh, some of the thenar eminence to be involved as well. So what about radiculopathy? Well, that could certainly be the case here. A C78 uh, would certainly cause that. And let's have a look at the neurophysiology now. So first of all, sensory nerve action potential responses. If you haven't already seen the video on normative data, please do so now. Um, however, keeping this very brief, we have normal conduction velocities here for all the sensory responses, they're all about 50 meters per second. We also have normal amplitudes as well. So there are above 10 microvolts for the median innovated F2 responses, and they are above five microvolts for the ulna responses, and they're very symmetrical. So these indicate we are not dealing with a postganglionic process, and I'll explain more about that soon. Let's have a look at the motor amplitudes. So for the median nerve, we've got normal distal motor latencies, we've got normal conduction velocities in the forearm, and we've got normal motor amplitudes as well. We can see there's a slight increase in the F latency on the right side to the APB compared to the left. Nothing dramatic, but a little bit raised. Let's have a look at the ulnar motor responses. So we've got normal distal motor latencies bilaterally. We've got normal conduction velocities in the forearm and in the around elbow segment as well. However, when we look at the motor amplitudes, we can see that there is a significant reduction on the right-hand side of motor amplitude compared to the left. So we've got 5.8 versus 11 millivolts at the wrist. And the pattern remains the same for below and above the elbow. F latency is again somewhat slightly prolonged on the right side compared to the left. Let's have a look at the EMG now. So we've got normal right biceps and right brachioradialis. These cover the C5, C6 innervated muscles. Triceps, which is C6, 7, and 8, showed some mild to moderate denervation there. The EDC, which is a C7, 8, and IDIO, again C7, 8, showed some active denervation with mild to moderate denervation changes there. And the APB, which is C8, T1, was normal. Putting that all together, what we have are normal sensory responses, reduced motor amplitudes for the ADM muscle, and EMG findings showing active moderate denervation in the C78 innervated muscles. These findings put the level of the lesion to C78. Therefore, we can conclude that there is a moderate and active right C78 motor radiculopathy and otherwise normal findings. Just to make a clinical point, as I try to do in all of these videos, if one finds sensory impairment above the level of the wrist crease in what appears to be an apparent ulnar neuropathy, then it's probably not an ulnar neuropathy and it's something higher to that, whether it's a uh, high nerve lesion, brachial plexopathy or a radiculopathy. I'd also like to make a clinical neurophysiological point as well, and that is 
If we have a look at the structure and placement of the dorsal root ganglion, we can see it lies just outside the intervertebral foramen. What this means is that it tends to be spared from radiculopathies because it tends to be outside the zone where the nerve roots, the spinal roots, can be crushed. Because of this, it's very useful for neurophysiologists such as myself to be able to localise lesions. We test circuits, and that means testing a nerve up to its cell body. The cell body of the sensory peripheral nerve is the dorsal root ganglion, so we can test responses all the way to it. And if there's any problems proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, the dorsal root ganglion will remain intact and maintain its axon. However, it won't be able to transmit the signal proximal to that. So we will still be able to detect sensory nerve action potentials because that's what we're testing and those will still remain intact. However, what we won't be able to pick up is any degradation of signal proximal to those unless we start using other modalities such as the evade potentials. This is very different in the case of the motor fibers where their cell body is actually in the anterior horn cell. And so what we can do is actually we can see a reduction in motor amplitudes and we can see evidence of denervation on EMG in scenarios where there is radiculopathy affecting the motor fibers as they go in towards the anterior horn cells. And for this reason, we label things as motor radiculopathies when we identify them because we can only identify motor radiculopathy using standard nerve conduction and EMG tests. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again in the next puzzle. Please do support this channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Your support means a lot to me and I'll be very grateful for any comments in the box below.